Chapter 42 Broken and Mended The year was 1948. After Phoenix, Arizona, William Branham conducted healing campaigns in Pensacola, Florida, Kansas City, Kansas, Sedalia, Missouri, and Elgin, Illinois. In every city, he told the crowds about his vision of a boy being raised from the dead, saying, Write it on the flyleaf of your Bible so that when it happens, you'll believe that I'm telling you the truth. His health continued to deteriorate. During the prayer services, he had difficulty keeping his balance while praying for the sick. He also had trouble falling asleep after each meeting, and if he did fall asleep, then he had trouble waking up for the next service. His head ached constantly, and at times his body trembled. His stomach turned sour, and nothing he ate agreed with him. Sometimes his mind clouded, drifting in and out of focus. He felt like a wreck. On Thursday, May 13, 1948, he began a five-night healing campaign in Tacoma, Washington. 6,000 people filled the ice arena to its capacity. Every night the prayer lines moved forward slowly, while Bill used the sign in his hand to detect their diseases and raise their faith high enough to accept Christ's healing power. Ruby Dillard was among those who came forward. At the time, Ruby was choking to death from a cancerous tumor in her throat. Later she wrote in the Voice of Healing magazine, Although my throat hurt as the cancer was leaving, I have had no more trouble since. Hundreds of people in the Tacoma campaign had testimonies that were just as amazing. By the end of the service, Monday night, Bill was again on the verge of total collapse. He tottered backwards from the prayer line and would have fallen if two men had not caught him. As these men carried him out, Bill pleaded with them to let him say goodbye to the people. Gordon Lindsay relayed this goodbye to the audience, not realizing at the time its deeper meaning. The next day, Bill called together his team of supporters, Jack Moore, Gordon Lindsay, Ern Baxter, and Fred Bosworth, telling them that Eugene, Oregon would be his last meeting for a while. All other commitments would have to be canceled. Naturally, these ministers wondered how long he might be off the field. Bill told them he didn't know. It might be only a few months, or it might be more than a year. But in his own mind, he was not so optimistic. By now, his energy was so far gone that he wondered if he could ever pray for the sick again. For Gordon Lindsay in particular, this news was a terrible blow. Not only had Lindsay resigned as a pastor of his church in Ashland, Oregon to follow the Branham campaigns, but he had also put his energy and planning into the Voice of Healing, a magazine that suddenly had no purpose. After much agonizing prayer, Lindsay realized that he had come too far with the Voice of Healing to turn back. The first two issues had rolled off the press. He decided to invest his personal savings to continue publication. What should be the magazine's focus now? Perhaps it needed nothing more than a new ministry to follow. There certainly was no shortage of candidates from which to choose. William Branham's meteoric rise on the national scene in 1946 had both raised public awareness of God's healing power and inspired others to follow in Bill's footsteps. Dozens of healing ministries sprouted in 1947, and by this time in 1948, the roster was still growing. For a few issues, the Voice of Healing featured William Freeman, a young man who is having moderate success praying for the sick. But Gordon Lindsay sensed that if the Voice of Healing was to survive without the influence of William Branham's name, it should not limit itself to reporting on one individual, but should encompass a wide range of healing deliverance ministries. After all, thought Lindsay, how many times have I heard Brother Branham say that Jesus Christ is the only healer? Meanwhile, Bill languished at home, sick and dejected. Day after day, he tossed in bed while his stomach churned like a vat of caustic acid. Whenever he tried to eat, hot, greasy water would come up his throat and burn his mouth. His weight dropped to just over a hundred pounds. His eyes sank back into their sockets. His face looked gaunt and pale. When he stood, his head throbbed and his legs barely supported him. He felt like he was dying. Doctors could not help him. They labeled his illness as nervous exhaustion brought on by overwork and they prescribed plenty of bed rest. 
but after two months of following doctor's orders, Bill still felt deathly ill. Unto the Lord he cried in prayer, to Jesus, his life, to Jesus, his love, to Jesus, his only hope. He begged for his healing day after day, yet after all this, Bill did not improve. He brooded. How many thousands of healings and miracles had he watched in his meetings? The Lord had healed them. Why wouldn't the Lord heal him? It did not seem fair. Eventually, Bill realized the answer. The Lord was teaching him something essential. When Bill reviewed the last two years of his ministry, he was ashamed of the way he had pushed himself beyond the boundaries of good sense. Jonesboro was an extreme example where he had stayed in the pulpit for eight straight days and nights praying for the sick. But overall, he had hurt himself more by habitually keeping his prayer lines moving until one or two o'clock in the morning. Actually, he had suspected all along that he was making a mistake, but his heart sympathized with all those hurting people, knowing that for many of them, life or death hinged on his prayers. So he had pushed himself and pushed and pushed and pushed. Now he was paying the price. He had done this to himself, and now God wanted him to learn his lesson. Bill realized that just because God had given him a gift of healing did not mean God expected the whole burden to rest on his shoulders. He read in Exodus 19 how Moses, entrusted with the care of two million Israelites in the Sinai desert, wore himself thin trying to handle the people's problems all by himself. Jethro, his father-in-law, urged Moses to divide the workload among other capable men in the camp. In Numbers chapter 11, Bill read how God took the spirit that was on Moses and spread it out among 70 elders so they could help Moses carry the load. As Bill thumbed through the latest issue of The Voice of Healing, he marveled at how many men and women were now conducting healing campaigns across the United States and Canada. William Freeman, Oral Roberts, Jack Coe, Tommy Osborne, A. A. Allen, W. V. Grant, and many more. Some of these people he knew personally because they had sat in his meetings and had shaken his hand, like Tommy Osborne, a young minister who sat in the Portland, Oregon meeting the night that maniac threatened to break every bone in Bill's body. But it wasn't seeing that hulking 250-pound man drop unconscious to the floor that inspired young Osborne. It was watching Bill lay his hands on the deaf-mute girl and quietly say, Thou deaf and dumb spirit, I adjure thee in Jesus' name, leave the child. When Bill snapped his fingers, the girl could hear. Then she spoke. That sparked a fire in Tommy Osborne's soul to launch his own independent ministry, a ministry that was now burning a path of salvation and healing through the devil's territory, igniting hearts to faith in Christ. Another name Bill recognized was Oral Roberts. Bill first met this young man last summer in Tulsa, Oklahoma. At that time, the 32-year-old Roberts had just begun his own independent deliverance ministry and was still unsure as to the direction he should travel. After attending one of Bill's meetings and witnessing the healing power of Jesus Christ, Oral Roberts decided that he should emphasize divine healing in his own ministry. Bill met Oral Roberts again in Kansas City in the spring and was amazed at how much the man had matured in ten months. Roberts now radiated confidence and leadership. Because of this young man's natural flair for showmanship, his ministry expanded monthly. Roberts also had a shrewd mind for business. To cut the overhead costs of his campaigns, he bought his own tent. Besides broadcasting his own radio program, he printed his own magazine called Healing Waters. These two enterprises increased his sphere of influence and broadened the base of his financial support. Impressed by the sincerity and initiative of Oral Roberts, Bill drew some comfort from knowing that he had influenced this bold young preacher. In fact, paging through the voice of healing, Bill realized that his own ministry had influenced every one of these men and women, either directly or indirectly. When he had started out in 1946, not one other minister in America was holding large campaigns and preaching divine healing. Now they seem to be everywhere. 
each one preaching a variation of Bill's theme that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That should not surprise him. Wasn't that what the angel of the Lord had told him that night in the cabin? You are sent to take a gift of divine healing to the people of the world. At the time, Bill had assumed he was supposed to personally deliver the gift. Now he could see that he was only the spark for worldwide revival. His 24-month ministry had ignited holy fire in tens of thousands of hearts, and now the wind of the Holy Spirit was fanning revival flames in every direction. Did that mean God was finished with him? No, that could not be. The angel told him he would be given two signs to prove he was sent from God. So far he had only seen one, the sign in his hand. What about the second sign? The angel told him that if he would be sincere, it would come to pass that he would know the very secrets of people's hearts. Bill had no idea what that meant, but he knew it hadn't happened yet. Nor had the vision been fulfilled of the boy being raised from the dead. Surely God was not through with him yet, unless, and he prayed that this was not true, unless he had short-circuited God's plan for his life by squandering away his energy. On September 15, 1948, Bill visited the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, hoping that the doctors there could help him. For three days, a team of specialists subjected him to every conceivable test that might turn up a clue. On his last morning in Rochester, Bill woke up feeling anxious. In a few hours, he would go over to the clinic and get the final report in his condition. Would there be any hope for him? Or was he finished? He sat on the edge of his bed and prayed, Dear Jesus, people with every kind of nervous breakdown there is came into my meetings, and you healed them. Why won't you heal me? Through the years you've showed me visions of other people's healings, but you've never showed me one about my own. I've been plagued by this terrible nervousness on and off since I was a kid. Now my strength is so far gone, I can't seem to get a hold of myself to believe your word for my healing. What is going to become of me? As soon as he finished praying, he felt himself falling into a vision. The hotel room vanished. Bill seemed to be in a wooded hollow. In front of him, he saw a seven-year-old boy standing next to an old dead snag of a tree. Where had Bill seen that face before? Suddenly he knew. The boy looked just like he himself had looked at that age. Why, it was him! Suddenly Bill noticed a furry shape scurry into a hole in the snag. Bill said to the boy, Let me show you how to get that squirrel out. He picked up a stick and wrapped it up and down the side of the tree trunk. This was an old hunting trick used to flush a squirrel out of a hollow log. It worked now, but the creature that scrambled out of this snag looked more like a weasel, although not exactly. It had a long, thin, black body a small head and tiny beady black eyes. It looked wicked and ferocious. Careful, Bill cautioned the boy. Don't go near that old snag. You can't tell how dangerous that critter might be. Bill turned around to see if the boy was heeding his warning. The boy, himself as a boy, was no longer there. Bill turned back to the tree. The animal snarled, tensing its body as though it might attack. Bill didn't have a gun. All he had to protect himself was a small hunting knife hanging on his belt. Nervously, he thought, If that squirrel attacks me, this knife is not going to be much use. I'm really vulnerable here. From behind him and to his right, Bill heard the angel of the Lord say, Remember, it's only six inches long. Bill reached for his knife. Before he could slide the blade from its sheath, the creature jumped, landing on his shoulder. Bill stabbed at it, but the squirrel was too nimble. It darted from shoulder to shoulder so fast that Bill could not even scratch it. Bill opened his mouth to say something. Quick as a bullet, the animal scrambled into his mouth and down his throat. Bill could feel it running around and around in his stomach, just tearing him to pieces. Throwing up his hands, Bill cried out, Oh God, have mercy! As he came out of the vision, he heard the angel's voice repeating that enigmatic line, Remember, it's only six inches long. Shaken, Bill collapsed back on the bed. 
Me disturbed, but didn't wake up. For a long time, Bill lay there considering the vision. That odd-looking squirrel must refer to his nervous condition, which would attack his stomach with such force that he felt like he was dying. But what did that seven-year-old boy represent? Bill remembered that he was seven years old when the first nervous spell hit him. Seven. That was his age when he had realized how many things were wrong in his life. His father drank. His family was poor. He was a misfit in school, and to top it all off, he saw things that other people couldn't see. No wonder he had turned nervous and melancholy. This vision was beginning to make sense. Suddenly, he saw a pattern. This nervous condition came back on him about every seven years with regularity. It struck him the second time when he was fourteen, after his cousin accidentally shot him in the legs with a shotgun. During that bedridden winter, he suffered for months with nervous depression. About seven years later, fumes from a natural gas pipeline overcame him, which triggered such severe stomach trouble that he nearly died. For five months, he lived on prune juice and barley soup. He would have starved to death if the Lord had not healed him. Seven years later, Hope and Sharon Rose died. That tragedy devastated him, making him such a nervous wreck that he had tried to kill himself. Slowly, the Lord Jesus pulled him back together, and over the next period of years, his nerves remained steady, bothering him no more than would be considered normal. And then came the angel's commission, and for the last two years, Bill had pushed himself to the limit of his human endurance. Finally, his body rebelled. Plunging him into this pit of nervous exhaustion, still thinking about the vision, he next considered the little knife. During this last week of tests, one doctor had suggested a possible cure: cutting some of the nerves to his stomach. The knife in his vision must represent the surgeon's scalpel, showing Bill that an operation would be useless against this enemy. What about the angel's words? Remember, it's only six inches long. Could that mean he would suffer with this stomach ailment for only six months? If that was true, then God was going to heal him soon, because it was about six months since this episode of sickness began. His spirit soared in hope. Then a sobering thought brought him down. Nothing in the vision suggested that the odd-looking squirrel died. Did that mean this problem would return in seven years? Would he have to suffer these attacks periodically for the rest of his life? Oh, if he could just see a vision where that squirrel would die, then he would know it was all over. A few hours later, Bill sat in an office at the Mayo Clinic, listening intently to an elderly doctor explain the results of his tests. Young man, I'm sorry to tell you this, but your condition is inherited. Like many Irishmen, your father loved his whiskey. Your mother is half Indian, and we know that Indians can't tolerate alcohol. Mixing these two sets of genes has given you this nervous condition. You will never be well. Your nerves affect your stomach, and this causes your food to be thrown back up. There is no cure for this, and there is nothing we can do. You'll have this problem for the rest of your life. When Bill got back to Jeffersonville, his mother came over to find out what the clinic doctors had said. Bill remarked, "I would be a discouraged man right now if the Lord had not given me hope in that vision." Ella Branham nodded. "Billy, it's interesting you had that vision on Thursday morning because early that same morning I had a strange dream about you." Bill knew his mother almost never dreamed, but on the few occasions when she had, her dreams always seemed to carry a spiritual significance. Such as the time following Bill's conversion, when she dreamed she saw him standing on a white cloud, preaching to the whole world. Ella continued, "I dreamed that while you were lying sick on the porch, almost dead with your stomach trouble as usual, you were building a house on a hill out in the west. Then I saw Mother." Bill interrupted, "Let me finish it. After you saw me lying there sick, you saw six white doves fly down from heaven in the form of the letter S." They landed on my chest. The one nearest my head kept cooing and rubbing its head against my cheek, as though he was trying to tell me something. He seemed sorry. Then I shouted, "Praise the Lord!" Just before you woke up. That's right. How did you know, Mother? You know that whenever someone tells me a dream that has a spiritual meaning, 
the Lord shows me the same dream along with the interpretation. That's no different than in the Bible. Remember when King Nebuchadnezzar was bothered by a nightmare and wanted to know what it meant? Trouble was, he couldn't remember what the nightmare was about. So the Lord showed Daniel the same dream, and Daniel reminded the king what it was, which proved to Nebuchadnezzar that Daniel's interpretation came from God. Well, Billy, what does my dream mean? The Lord gave you this dream at the same time he gave me the vision. They are connected. The odd-looking squirrel represents my nervous condition, which comes on me about every seven years. The animal that attacked me was six inches long, and you saw six doves. That means that after every round of stomach trouble, I will be healed for a while. Biblically, six is an incomplete number. God is complete in seven. Someday I'll see that odd-looking squirrel die, and then I'll see a seventh dove, and the battle will be over. Two days later, Bill was sitting on his porch reading a book by Fred Bosworth called Christian Confession. Setting the book down, he picked up his Bible and opened it randomly. The pages parted at Joshua chapter 1. Bill read, Be thou strong and very courageous. The Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. Suddenly he knew this was to be his confession. Then he heard an inner voice whisper to him, I am the Lord that healeth thee. Joyfully Bill went into the house and hugged his wife, saying, Honey, God has just healed me.